So welcome everyone to this session called Every Wall in the Classroom, using locally created video and cordless projectors to improve learning outcomes. So we'd like to thank our sponsors and supporters for iEARN, the Global Campaign for Education, U.S. Chapter, EduChange, Adobe, BIS, Science for Us, EdWeb, EdSearch, and Blackboard Collaborate. So I'd like to take a moment and just ask everyone where they're from. We'll open up the whiteboard permissions. So you can click on the second icon down. Just click on the map where you are. And in the chat box, if you could tell us a little bit about your professional background and what brought you here today. So it looks like we've got some people from around the U.S. I know that we've got one people here from, okay, from Thailand. So we've got someone from Thailand and Indonesia. And those permissions just don't work on the devices that you're using. But we're happy that you're here. So in the chat box, could you tell us what your professional background is, just briefly? So we'll look forward to reading about that as they come in. So Matt's going to go ahead and get started with this presentation. Uh, so again, greetings everyone. Uh, so our presentation is about uh, transforming uh, any environment or any wall into a classroom, a, a learning opportunity. Uh, again, I'm Matt York, the founder and executive director of One Media Player Per Teacher. And we're all about using locally created video and cordless projectors to improve learning outcomes. So um, just a little explanation of our, of our name, our acronym. Um, one media player per teacher, also one media player per trainer, perhaps. Any, we, we, our goal is for every teacher or trainer uh, serving in the poorest populations in the world, the bottom billion, our, our vision is that all of them would have access to a media player. And a media player is a kind of an abstract term. It's actually a, both a piece of hardware and a piece of software. A media player is the piece of software that lives on your phone or on your, uh, your iPod that converts a digital file, an audio file or a video file, into something that a human can hear or see. That's what a media player is. But also a media player is a piece of hardware like again, you know, like an iPod or in our case, um, these uh, Pico projectors. This is a, a small battery powered or cordless projector. <clears throat> and uh, they're really quite amazing. Uh, the light comes out of the front here. There's several models out there um, that um, are the keystone of our intervention. Uh, so uh, we've uh, we're excited about this intervention and look forward to elaborating on it in this presentation. So, um, so here's our outline for the session. Uh, we have this new acronym. I know our industry, our, our, our category collectively loves acronyms, so we've come up with a new one, uh, LOCP, L-O-C-P. And we will describe that as local origination of video that's cordlessly projected. So local origination, meaning that the video should be produced or should originate as close to the beneficiary population as possible. If we were to make video here in Northern California and, uh, and uh, transport it to Indonesia, for example, we think it would be much less, much less effective because I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not a, a trusted source there in Indonesia. So the, uh, the, the pronunciation of, of words, the language used, 
the ethnicity of the of the people on camera, the background. Uh, these are all things that we believe that the closer that the content is created to the beneficiary community, the better. Not only uh, you know continentally, we're in the you know the West here, but also even within a country, the closer that the video is created uh, to the beneficiary population, the better. And our organization teaches uh, NGOs how to do that, and we'll discuss that a little bit later. And also, we are really big believers in cordless projection. So this intervention is really focused on hard-to-reach populations where the internet and the electrical grid are absent. So these are ways in which we can um, access these populations or assist NGOs in accessing these populations. Local origination, cordless projection, uh, lock P. Um, so we um, we address specific, we help NGOs um, address specific local needs. NGOs that are local or ministries of government who are local, they know the, the needs. They have curriculum, they have knowledge and solutions, and most of it is presented orally uh, or presented maybe sometimes in the form of flip books or even drama. Uh, but the local organizations really know what the needs are. And as a result, they, they are best suited to deliver this in a culturally sensitive co uh, context. Um, so we, uh, our, our advocacy is that we uh, increase production capacity, so really to create new media. So video is a relatively new media or new medium for most NGOs are not really using it under most ministries of, of, uh, of government. So this intervention advocates the a simple production style using very simple equipment. Um, often the cameras that can be used these days are as simple as a, a mobile phone. So this happens to be an Android phone, there are iPhones, there are Windows based phones that all shoot totally acceptable video and they're edited on laptops using very simple user interfaces. Um, Windows laptops have a free accessory called Movie Maker which you can download from the Microsoft website and you can uh, master editing a video with this free accessory and it's, it's very, very straightforward. So um, once the video is edited and put on the cordless projectors, uh, the video then can be uh, delivered in remote places by lesser trained experts, para-experts, that will mediate the instruction so the expertise lies in the projector, um, stored typically on an SD card. So a little SD card will, can hold uh, 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 dozens of hours of video. So a local, uh, sometimes a village volunteer, other times a lower rank person in the ministry of government or in the NGO can deliver the content using a pause button with the remote control so they can rewind and, and review uh, points that are maybe a little more difficult to understand. Uh, but again, also uh, there are the use of non-expert mediators. So that's what LOCKP is, uh, is all about. So we'll talk a little bit about our model. Uh, so LOCKP, there's many organizations using LOCKP. Uh, our organization is just a big advocate for this model. Here's kind of what we do. So we train the staff members of NGOs around the world, the ministries, how to, how to make the video with the cameras and edit. And we, we, we do that over a four-day period of time in, in country with the assistance of a few bilingual in-country um, video enthusiasts that we have in a network around the world. And we uh, do this uh, with uh, these folks that we have uh, briefed with about the curriculum. Here's a, a photograph of some of our colleagues there in Addis Ababa. Actually, it's in Ambo, Ethiopia. So we've got about 1,500 of these volunteers, not volunteers, they really want to work for the prevailing wage in their country, but they're, they're video enthusiasts that we have gathered together through a website that we're affiliated with called videomaker.com. And about half a million people a month visit videomaker.com. And over the years, we've collected 1,500 um, video enthusiasts across 55 countries who are anxious to work with us to improve the living conditions uh, for their co-patriots within their country. 
So they, uh, this all works to improve the sustainability of the project. Because once we come, we return home, you can see there I'm in the middle of that photo, and Claire's on the left. When we return home, those three local folks continue to provide encouragement and support to the trainees that participated in the video education workshop. So we also bring equipment with us. Uh, we bring three different types of kits. Um, uh, all three of these kits are not uh, necessary in equal measure. So we'll review the co basic components of that. The camera kit is a simple video camera. You can see there that's a Kodak camera there, but very much like an Android or an iPhone. So it still could use the same type of thing. We really advocate the use of a tripod so that the camera can be stabilized so you get a stable picture. What makes for poor video is a, is a picture when people are just trying to hold the camera steady, but they're moving it just a little bit. So the tripod really is important to stabilize that. And also something as simple as an external microphone. This is a, a, a corded microphone. Um, connects by cord to the camera or to the phone, floats into the phone. And it goes on the uh, lapel or the clothing of someone and gets plugged into the into the phone and gives you really high quality audio. So that's the camera kit. Um, one camera kit could support uh, dozens or thousands even of projection kits. So an, an NGO or Ministry of Education may not need that many camera kits. But the projection kit um, includes, uh, again, the video, the cordless video projector. Light comes out of this. Difficult to demonstrate during a webinar today, uh, but they're depending upon the size and power of the cordless projector, they're sometimes almost as good as a corded projector that you might see in a typical meeting room in a capital city of any of these countries that we all work in. Um, but also, it, it should go along with a, a, a uh, an external speaker. This is a little external speaker. It also has its own battery. Uh, so this little speaker and this uh, projector are bright enough and loud enough to serve up to 50 people, 50 people in the audience, as long as the environment is properly prepared and the, the competing light is uh, dampened through uh, either doing it at nighttime or putting fabric over any windows that might be in an indoor environment. And the, the, the speaker is quite loud enough for 50 people, again, provided there's not any competing audio or competing sounds, like next to um, uh, a busy street or, uh, or a railroad. So that's the projection kit. And again, like one camera kit, there could be a team of people making one video a day and feeding the videos out to the remote areas by a way of uh, SD card. And um, I'm, I'm going to show you an example of an SD card. I don't have one within my reach right now. But these, um, these SD cards uh, can hold um, you know, about an hour of video for each, each gigabyte. And this actually is a micro SD card, which is absolutely amazing that this little thing about the size of my fingernail can hold dozens of hours of video. This particular one is 16 gigabytes, so it'll hold 16 hours of video. But there are 32 gigabyte cards and 64 gigabyte cards, and soon to be 128, 256. So it becomes a limitless concern. So um, the new video is transported from the place where it's edited out into the field uh, by way of sneaker net, just carrying this thing in your pocket and walking with your sneakers is a slang term here in the US for tennis shoes or, or shoes. And lastly, we have these recharging kits, which uh, allow the users to recharge any of the equipment uh, with solar panels, like these two solar panels can be used to uh, recharge uh, the projector or the, or the camera. Uh, there's another one there on the slide. Also, all of these devices can be recharged by an adapter that would go into the dashboard of an automobile. So some of these remote environments, are, uh, this, this device can be inserted into the cigarette lighter of, of an automobile. And then on the back side, you see a USB connector. So we can plug in anything that is USB charged 
uh, into this device. We've also probably seen these. But also, if there's no cars nearby, or if the sun is, sun is not shining, we can actually recharge these devices from the battery terminals of a motor scooter battery. And we use these uh, alligator clips to connect to the motor scooter battery. And on the other end is really that same thing that the, the uh, female cigarette lighter adapter. So these are three different ways of charging equipment in, in remote places. Solar, uh, automotive, or motor scooter. So you might need a, 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 an NGO or ministry of government may need just one or two or three camera kits, but they can use dozens of projection kits. Now, if all of the projection kits are used far off the grid, then you would really want a recharging kit for every, every projection kit. But if half of the users of the projection kits um, return to the power grid each night or return to a location where there might be uh, a diesel power generator, then you really wouldn't need the, as, an exact number of recharging kits for every projection kit. So uh, the OMPT uh, model is all about empowering organizations uh, and schools to increase and improve the behavior adoption. So if it's about uh, a, a hygiene practice like washing hands, uh, that's a really explicit behavior that can be uh, driven home and adopted. Uh, we, that's, that, that's the NGO's objective. And that can be done through um, just having expert lecturers videotaped or recorded, but also using testimonials of people in the region who didn't used to engage in the behavior, had doubts about the behavior, and then decided to try the behavior and saw that there were good results, that the, the, the children weren't as sick as often once the hand washing began. And now that the whole village has adopted that behavior, those testimonials will help the unexposed villages or the villages that are not adopting the behavior to be more uh, likely to adopt the behavior. Also, this, uh, this intervention, LOCP, can be used for general knowledge transfer, uh, which is more applicable for uh, basic education, uh, literacy, or numeracy. So there would be a whole lot of curriculum, lots of uh, hours each day delivered. Um, it can drive up learning outcomes if, we're, if an NGO or a Ministry of Education is tracking grade point average. Uh, it can increase uh, learning outcomes or even donor communication. So many of you out there are working with the donor community who are always having some elusive imagination or reading of reports about what impact is their support really having. Well, you can use these, uh, these video cameras to videotape the uh, beneficiary community uh, in the midst of benefiting so that you can then, uh, or the NGO or the Ministry of, of Government, can make short videos about the impact of the intervention, whatever intervention, whatever the NGO is doing, and bring it back to those stakeholders who are accountable for the financial resources for the organization's impact. So we can talk a little bit about implementation styles. Um, so if, it, if, uh, if the users are really um, uh, not incredibly confident or not incredibly technically adept or not in incredibly competent, they could just point the um, they could just point the camera on a tripod uh, at an expert, an expert math teacher, an expert um, uh, sanitation uh, lecturer, and they simply record a 15-minute lesson by that individual and transfer it um, onto an SD card, and uh, it goes to a, a laptop for editing, comes out of the laptop, and is inserted into the projector. And it's just really, we're just tra virtually transporting the expertise from the place where it's abundant, usually in a capital city, to places where it's very rare because there's, the staff is um, typically lean. There's not a lot of people on staff or many of the staff members maybe, maybe lack expertise. So just simply moving a 15-minute lecture, simply recorded, is, is the most primitive way to implement this intervention. Uh, a, a, a baby step a little more uh, advanced is to use cutaways. So if there's an NGO that's talking, uh, an expert talking about hand washing, 
that can cut away to, uh, to some hands being washed, maybe, or even maybe a cutaway to uh, a close-up of what bacteria looks like that's being uh, killed by the ingredients in the soap, or if there is an, uh, a, a different application where someone's teaching uh, numeracy and they're teaching the number six, they can cut away to a big number six, uh, just in a graphic. Uh, so point and shoot is very basic. Cutaways, just illustrating whatever points are being made. Um, if, they're, if the NGO is a bit, or the, the uh, organization is a bit more ambitious, they can integrate animation. So we can help to illustrate the life cycle of a waterborne disease. Uh, so we can show how it lives perhaps under the fingernails of an individual who's not washing their hands, uh, but then they, they, it moves from there into the food and from the food into like an infant's mouth. And once it gets into the infant's mouth, into the stomach, and how it replicates or how it uh, um, grows in the intestines and to the point where perhaps there's a, an acute illness and even potentially death. So animation is an important component in the production uh, phase of this, uh, of this intervention. Uh, in dissemination, um, we can uh, uh, help an NGO or a government uh, ministry use their existing extension networks. So that would be ag extension staff, uh, community health workers, uh, or rural health centers. So there would be not a need to, to replicate and, or create something new, but just kind of integrate the, these projectors are relatively portable. These are easy to transport. It takes a little dis discipline to recharge them at night, but many of these individuals are recharging mobile phones at night. So the existing extension network is really fantastic. Again, using the sneaker net to transport the uh, video on these SD cards around uh, could be used by a postal system or just simply carrying them in, in one's pockets. And also in schools. So schools are gathering places where where individuals gather on a, a regular recurring basis or community community centers. So just kind of piggybacking on these existing uh, existing networks. And the pictures on the on the screen there shows a bit of a the production style and the upper image. The lower image there, it's a rural village. Uh, there's a, a white uh, piece of fabric on the wall there. It's uh, just maybe like a bed sheet. These people are far off the grid. They've never seen video before. Uh, behind the knee of the standing person, that's a vi video resource, uh, a village volunteer, a village resource person, VRP they call them. Behind his knee is a little Pico projector. And this group of people in this village are, are seeing video, um, which is a, a new intervention, a new development for them. And it certainly gets their attention and it helps the, the village volunteer make their points uh, well. So we'll talk a little bit about examples from the field. Um, uh, in January, uh, we did, uh, well, actually we did one of four uh, projects with uh, with Save the Children, all surrounding their literacy boost program. The most recent one was in Ethiopia, and the discipline was basic education. So their literacy boost program is really all about getting parents and community members, in addition to teachers, to engage in the process of ensuring that the next generation uh, has greater li literacy skills. So we did this four-day training, and some um, of the folks from World Vision also attended because they're also involved in Literacy Boost. So that was a project we did with both uh, World Vision and Save the Children in Ethiopia. Uh, we also did a project in Eastern India, Lucknow, India, with Digital Study Hall. And the discipline there was basic education. So here we are in a classroom, again, videotaping a competent teacher who is you know, well-educated and very confident. Uh, in a private school that's you know very clean and you know has high tuition and and wealthy parents are paying that tuition to send their children there, but we helped uh, Digital Study Hall to record um, these lessons on a daily basis and transport them out to poor villages and towns in eastern India. Another um, example was um, a project in Rwanda, Be the Change Volunteer Program. The discipline there is financial literacy. We did that project with global communities, formerly known as CHF. So helping uh, 
folks to be a little more um, diligent, responsible with uh, their managing of their personal finances through savings groups, uh, the concept of insurance or saving for a rainy day. And again, they all of these instances, the, the local NGOs have the expertise and we just help them to to produce short videos to get them to rural locations where these experts may never go. And the last example we have is uh, a project called Raising Awareness for the No Bay Rights. This is an indigenous group of people uh, who live in rural uh, Panama. We did the uh, education and the training in Tole, Panama. And at this one was civic engagement. These individuals um, were being served by an NGO called CIASPA. And there were like three things at stake here that where civic engagement was an important way to mediate uh, these three uh, threats. So one was the auctioning of mineral rights for copper mining in their territory, the auctioning of hydroelectric rights on the streams and rivers in their community, and also the auctioning of coastal real estate for uh, resort development. So these are three things that would impact the indigenous people who are choosing to live a very simple lifestyle, but the government owned these um, these rights and was auctioning it off. So the NGO Seaspa, what their goal was to increase civic engagement by their goal, their, their metric was to increase the attendance of, of weekly meetings or monthly meetings and increase the number of intelligent questions being asked by the attendees. So again, by the use of uh, videos showing how these three threats manifested in nearby communities or nearby countries, the local communities were mobilized to better advocate for themselves so they can maybe prevent things that were going to be ultimately detrimental or advocate for maybe jobs or some, some um, share of the bounty. So if there was going to be enormous mining successes with copper, so it's just the downside, maybe the local communities would participate in some benefit where they would they would see some revenue for a community center or scholarships for the young people. So that's what a civic engagement in Tole for the uh, SIASPA program was all about. So um, that's a good uh, overview of what we do. And again, we're not the only organization in the world that does local origination and cordless projection, but we really see that this is going to be uh, an intervention that's going to cascade around the world for any NGO or any government ministry trying to access hard to reach populations. It's a fantastic way to replicate expertise and to allow para experts or even local volunteers to get the word out to really get, to get for knowledge transfer uh, for, uh, for um, the adoption of new behaviors or a variety of other uh, communication purposes. So, uh, look forward to your questions. Uh, we covered a lot of ground kind of quickly, but um, I look forward to uh, yeah, fielding some of your questions now. So Ed asked um, about the Digital Study Hall project. If that was at the Study Hall Foundation School. Yes, yeah, so the, um, in the case of Digital Study Hall, there actually is a, a, a private school that was founded by a U.S. educated uh, woman, uh, Urabashi. So she's got a private school. So that is the source of the expertise. That's where the video is made on a, on a recurring basis. Um, so you always want, th this intervention always requires experts. Um, and ideally, it's great to have experts making presentations on a continual basis. So with schools, it's very, very easy. You know, with healthcare, you know, it's, they're maybe not as often you would see healthcare presentations, but certainly if there are healthcare presentations for best practices of nutrition or sanitation that occur on a, on a regular basis. So uh, in the case of Digital Study Hall, there was a, 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 um, a for-profit entity called just simply Study Hall that was in Lucknow, India. Don't have any more questions. Yet. Okay. And oh, okay, okay. So I'm uh, sorry what one or two of you out there maybe had no sound. Um, but if there's no, uh, no further questions, um, we can um, I'll turn it back over to Claire.
Thanks, everyone, for attending. And we'll stay here for a few more minutes to answer any questions that you might have. Um, you had our contact information on the screen for a while. So feel free to get in touch if we can support your work in any way, if this is something that you or your organization is looking at doing. Um, so it looks like we do have another question. Oh, having trouble with this sound still. But. Um, this is kind of the finishing slide, so thanking you for attending. And um, when you're ready, you can leave the room, and this will be available um, for you to watch at a future date. Do you want to ask a question? I turned on your mic if you wanted to use that, or you can type it in the chat box. Okay, the mic. Uh, yeah, thanks for the mic. Uh, Matt, I, uh, I'm actually based in Chiang Mai, which is in Thailand, about an hour's flight north of Bangkok. Uh, <laughs> actually, m most of my work is with uh, international schools and organizations which are have lots of money, and uh, so so don't go for the Pico projectors. But but I had done some work with Pico projectors, and have continually been disappointed with the 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 low luminosity there. That it really only works in a, a blacked out room. Now maybe my my experience is a bit out of date. It sounds like that the quality of them have improved if you're being able to use them in a partially blacked out room. How 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 you find? And I, I saw the photograph. You had about 50. One of your photographs you had about 40, 50 children on the sat on the floor, watching, or looking at a wall. Um, are the Pico projectors that good? Are they, are they get are they getting better? Is really my question. Okay, great question. So um, yes, they're getting better, and uh, there are actually at least three categories of cordless or battery powered projectors. Pico is the most um, popular one, uh, the, the word, the, the prefix pico is a, from the metric system, meaning you know, small, smaller than micro. So they are very small, like this one. And um, so their size, their brightness, and the, uh, the battery capacity are all quite small. And you're right, these are, these are marginal um, unless you have a very, very black out room. Uh, the next size up is a mini projector, which actually is a bit larger than this one. Um, so 3M had this fantastic product called the MP220, which they recently stopped making. So it's a bit larger, a, a bit brighter, uses more energy, takes a bit more energy to charge it. And then on the on the third level, maybe you can get one clear if I have one, uh, is a is a small projector, and. Um, they're about the size of, uh, they're about this big. Claire's going to try to dig one up. They're about as big as this box. It's a small projector, even brighter, um, requires more energy. They're actually, they, they come shipped with a laptop power supply. And everyone knows the laptop power supplies look like they convert AC to DC. So here's a, a laptop power supply. So in one end is AC. Out the other end is DC, so we've actually uh, created some batteries that can run a small projector. So there are three types of projectors again. The, so if you if you have very very um, lots of competing light, you'd want to go with a brighter projector. But you're right, the uh, progress being made here is significant. So we all know how much power we get in our our, our smartphones these days. Five years ago, these were they didn't exist in, a, in the same iteration. So the technology behind pickup projectors is LED technology, light emitting diodes, and the next generation of uh, each each 18 months, the next generation of LEDs is much more many more lumens per watt. So uh, this is a moving target, only moving in a direction that helps all of us. It's like wind in our sails. So what might not have been practical six months ago is going to be more practical in six months from now. So 
Uh, I, I assure you that all of you will, working in hard to reach locations, will wind up using these cordless projectors someday. Does that answer your question? That, that's, that's great. That's great. Thanks. Matt, I, I remember I've seen on the shelves a mobile phone which has a projector built in. Have you ever played with those? I can't remember which make it was. Yeah, so um, there, uh, Samsung makes one of that, one of those, and uh, they're a, an interesting tool. So if for some reason the uh, use case requires uh, downloading a video um, off the internet, but there's sufficient telephonic or, or mobile internet connectivity, then you can use that. But um, you know, in general, we are not we're not bound to connectivity either. Broadband or, or, or narrow band. Uh, we're all, nor are we committed to sneaker net using the the, um, the SD cards. So uh, we think all of those ways to get the content out there is, are effective. So if for some use case you need mobile connectivity because you don't have the the video handy, you don't have it wasn't planned out. It's a great way to deliver it. But any mobile phone that has a projector and it would be a Pico projector, meaning the, the least bright. Uh, and so, so they're certainly practical, but if you need more lumens of, of, of a mobile phone with a Pico projector built in would be an ideal solution. And Ed had a question along similar lines. If a smart telephone has videos on it, can they be projected directly? Yes, yeah, so some, some projectors, or most of them, have uh, an input for uh, VGA or for HDMI in the back. There's a jack. So some phones have an output for HDMI or for VGA, and there's a cable that would connect the two. Um, we're of the opinion that it's really best to put the stuff on the SD cards because it's really the simplest. But there is certainly, in many instances, a way to get video from a mobile phone. Uh, out uh, by way of a cable into a, a projector. Uh, but then there's two devices to manage, two devices to keep charts, but it's entirely technically possible. Any other last minute questions? Thanks, Ed, and thanks everyone who's attended. Well, okay. Well, thank you all, and we look forward to all of you considering embracing this with whatever um, NGO you might see this. So it's certainly going to be a more popular intervention. And in oh, got another question here. Preferred camera model. Okay, so um, uh, the camera that we were using that we found the greatest value. They were like one hundred dollars, and uh, they had uh, an important feature. So a place to plug in the microphone. We, we definitely advocate the use of a, of a microphone, an extra microphone that goes on the clothing of someone. And inexpensive cameras that have a place to plug in this microphone cord are, are rare. So the, the, the model we used was this, this Kodak Easy Touch, $100, and had a microphone input. Unfortunately, Kodak stopped making them. Um, but most. Uh, Android phones and iPhones will also receive the um, the the uh, external microphone. Might need an adapter, but really, right now, we we believe that mobile phones are kind of the future of of video cameras because they're they're ubiquitous and they're really quite sufficient in terms of the quality of the video. But there's a, a little bit of a, a know-how to get the microphone plugged in. Um, so uh, right now, I would say if you can get a Kodak Play Touch, get that because its price performance is really fantastic. Otherwise, maybe use a mobile phone. Yeah. So you did. So you can use an external mic on your iPad, on your iPhone. Again, um, there's some little nuance here. If you look really, really close at this connector here, you see one black ring on there. So um, iPhones have actually three black rings. So there's an adapter that goes from one black ring to three black rings, and we'd be happy to kind of 
provide you with greater insight about that offline. Just email us, and we'll give you some insight on how to how to uh, understand more about that. So it's good to see questions kind of dribbling in. Okay, okay, very good. So if there are no more questions, we'll start wrapping things up. Everyone has to leave the session before um, we can stop recording. Um, but this presentation will be available uh, directly after we finish. So thanks again for coming. I think that he's actually left and that we just had multiple things. So oh. And I can actually. Um, can you turn off? Oh, well, I guess I can do it here.